Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, I'm going to use the next 15 minutes to talk about a systematic review that we've been part of updating and, and trying to understand what is the global burden of disease among transgender populations. And so today, obviously, I'll focus on what we know about HIV among trans women specifically, and then I'll present data supporting a uh, conceptual framework uh, that uh, us and others have worked on to try and understand these situated vulnerabilities or gendered vulnerabilities among transgender populations around the world. Uh, I'll then talk about what we know about HIV interventions and in a little bit building on Carlos's earlier t uh, comment around mathematical models supporting combination prevention for transgender populations and then some thoughts on moving forward. So we um, embarked on a large systematic review to try and understand uh, the various uh, different disease entities that disproportionately affect trans populations. And so looking at all the literature, we were able to pull together about 116 studies representing data from 30 countries. Interestingly, nearly 100 different definitions of transgender populations within those, and so I think that is, is an area of, of, of further study in of itself. But what we had were about 1,000 different data points uh, which represent both epidemiologic studies, mostly epidemiologic studies, and also some intervention studies. Uh, for which uh, will serve as the basis for this discussion. I think there was a few things that we also looked at in terms of what the data set was. Uh, and, and one of the things that came out very clearly to us was that the majority of data focused, people, uh, focused on people who were assigned to male sex at birth, so mostly on trans women. Uh, in total, we had about 6% of studies that really exclusively focused on people who were assigned to female sex at birth. And so, you know, when we talk about how little we know in some ways about transgender populations, we know particularly little about trans men. Uh, another element was in terms of where we know what we know. And so here you're looking obviously at a map of the world, and in yellow you're seeing where we had one study uh, that had been published, uh, and that represented a few countries around the world. Uh, in, in blue you see where there were between two to five uh, different studies published. And in orange, uh, it's not a typo, this is where we had more than 60 studies published. Uh, and obviously that just represents the United States. And so the vast majority of data that focuses on transgender populations has been published uh, based on studies that have been completed in the United States. But you know, when you look at, in terms of what we know about the prevalence and, and the numbers of trans populations, that there's more similarities than there are differences. And so this is uh, from an upcoming paper by Sam Winter et al, where they looked at what studies have been done to understand the population-based uh, population studies looking at, at the prevalence of transgender populations. And you see that actually from data from Europe, the US, uh, New Zealand, you see actually a remarkable consistency of about 0.5 to 0.8% of the population um, you know, identifies transgender. And so in fact, while the majority of studies have been done in the United States, likely um, there's been an understudy of, of these populations in, in most other settings. So a few years ago, starting to talk about the epidemiology, a few years ago we completed this systematic review looking at the burn of HIV among trans populations. And there was a few things that were striking and that have continued to be striking. One was that we only had data at that point from you know, 10 uh, low and middle income settings and five high income settings. But there were these parts of the world that remained completely unstudied. So the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, are were all places where we couldn't find either surveillance studies uh, or um, published prevalence studies uh, looking at trans women. But I think what also came out was that while we're talking about smaller populations, was the remarkable disproportionate burden of HIV that, that, trans, women uh, that trans women bear. And so compared to other reproductive age uh, people, we were looking at nearly a 50 times increased risk of being, of living with HIV. So, you know, when we start sort of hammering in on, on what we know about different regions, you know, of, of course, across Sub-Saharan Africa, it is very rare for people currently to identify as transgender. And in, in the initial studies, if you look, uh, you know, sort of 10 or 15 years, they would ask that question almost as an entity of, of, of sexual orientation uh, rather than gender identity. And so using the two-step assessment developed by the Center of Excellence Transgender Health at UCSF, uh, Joanne Keatley et al., you know, just using a simple two-step assessment in terms of sex assigned at birth and uh, the gender that people identify, for studies that were funded as MSM studies, you see that 16% of people who accrued into these studies for in Burkina Faso, nearly 20% in Malawi, more than 25% in Swaziland, and nearly 10% in Lesotho actually don't identify as their gender assigned at birth. And both in Swaziland and Lesotho, that was highly associated with HIV. 
So it's just to say that, you know, while transgender populations haven't been studied in these places, in many of these settings, you start seeing that, in fact, there is obviously the presence of trans populations and, 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 uh, and, and, and clear needs. Tonya Potit et al. for uh, the Lancet, uh, Lancet special issue focused on sex work last year tried to look at the different levels of risk um, focused on trans populations. And similar to what Carlos spoke about earlier, we know that uh, individual level biological risks, individual level behaviors are contextualized by higher order structural and interpersonal risks. And so they did a very nice job defining these based on qualitative and quantitative data. We had also completed a systematic review trying to say, you know, we understand that there's a real rhetoric around the need to study these higher order risk factors, but we wanted to understand where people had actually engaged in, in this, and I should say in folks in low middle income countries, where people had engaged in studies looking at any structural risk or actually any risk factor that was above an individual level behavior and an HIV related outcome for, uh, for trans populations. And what came out was that the only study that we could find with all of the rhetoric was a study that was completed in India. Uh, and what it was, it was a study focused on trans uh, female sex workers and it showed that having higher collective efficacy with other trans female sex workers was associated with more consistent condom use with partners. But so that there's a disconnect in, uh, between the rhetoric around the structural determinants and, and with in combination prevention in general uh, and the actual level of study and investment in, in those sorts of structural interventions and even understanding those risks. But then we know, uh, this is uh, work that I'm gonna present by Sari Reisner and all at Fenway, and, and what he did was, uh, was use uh, electronic medical record data in Boston to match transgender youth to cisgender youth, uh, going back, looking at data from 2001 to 2010. And when you match um, trans to cisgender youth, you find that indeed, you know, trans youth have higher rates of depression, anxiety, high rates of suicide ideation, self-harm. So we recognize and, and we know that mental health issues are clearly associated with, with HIV related risks. But when we try and understand, we complete a study to try and then understand maybe determinants of mental health uh, quantitatively among trans populations. And so we did a study in Burkina Faso and Togo, two West African countries. Uh, where we accrued, again, uh, people initially for an MSM study, but did a two-step gender assessment. We used chi-square tests to uh, assess for bivariate associations with gender identity, and then we used a general, generalized structural equation model to try and delineate what some of these relationships would look like when we adjusted for other determinants. So in our sample, about a quarter of the sample identified as a woman, though were assigned the male sex at birth, so we had sufficient numbers to work with. And we use for depression the PHQ-9 as an assessment. So indeed, similar to the data published from the United States, we see that transgender women are more likely to have depression than our, our other MSM. But it's these other determinants in terms of verbal harassment, physical abuse, rape, and fear of seeking health care that were also significantly higher in adjusted analyses among trans uh, women than they were amongst other MSM. And I should say that these are places where the levels among MSM are already high, but obviously much higher amongst trans populations. And when we try to delineate the relationships, what we find is that indeed depression is a clear mediator uh, of, of an HIV related outcome, which here we, we have multiple of these models, but here we have fear of seeking healthcare. But when we look at the sort of upstream determinants of that mental health, we find that rape, verbal harassment, are clear upstream determinants as well as there being a clear relationship uh, independent of the others between verbal harassment and fear of seeking health care. Similarly, work from the United States, again completed by Sari Reisner et al, where he used the teen health and technology study. So this is a study that was predominantly focused on, on teens and cis teens, but included 442 transgender youth between 13 to 18 years of age. And, and he narrowed in here on substance use. And so what you can see in the first column is that w w in the column where it says without adjusting for bullying, what you can see is that you know, trans youth have higher rates of, of substance use, of ever drinking alcohol, of regular use uh, of both alcohol, marijuana, and smoking. But when you actually start adjusting for the bullying that people face, what you find is that most, or I should say, a significant amount of the relationship between 40 uh, to 50 percent of, of, of that relationship of increased amounts of substance use falls away. 
And in fact, you start seeing like uh, similar bur burdens of substance use between transgender youth as well as cisgender youth. So un unfortunately not coming out so nicely. But we also wanted to try and understand what are the ongoing combination prevention studies, really any dedicated prevention studies that are ongoing for, for trans populations. Uh, and so in Peru, there's a mobile HIV testing study, and then there's a few studies ongoing in Asia, uh, in addition to one study that's now being launched focused on PrEP in Peru. But what comes out so clearly is that there's such a disconnect between the burden of HIV and even the attributable fraction in some of these epidemics and the level of investment of both in terms of research as well as programming specifically focused on transgender populations. In the U.S., in terms of actively funded studies, there's the Life Skills Program in Boston, Chicago. There's T-Talk in New York City. There's Shiro's, uh, which is a gender affirmation intervention. Um, but you know, there's a basically a few of these studies for a population that we know to carry such a disproportionate burden of HIV. And again, sort of reinforcing what, what I think many identify as a disconnect. And so uh, when you look at what is the potential for, for prevention, the r similar to what Andrew spoke about for MSM, we don't have an incidence outcome. Uh, and so we're going to rely more on, on mathematical modeling data. So this is uh, work uh, led focused on transgender sex workers by Tonya Petit et al. and published in The Lancet uh, last year. And what they wanted to do was to say, you know, if they implemented comprehensive interventions, could you achieve a 50% decline uh, in new infections among transgender populations? And so they wanted to look at five interventions for which uh, they had data. So one was increased condom use with stable partners, pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, early access to treatment, decreasing the amount of commercial transactions that the sex workers were having, and also increasing condom use with clients. And I should say they used Lima and, and San Francisco because these represent the places where they have the best data for transgender populations really uh, around the world. And what you can see is, is in many ways what we would expect, which is that you know any one of these interventions on their own is not sufficient to reach that sort of threshold that they had set around a 50% decline in infections. However, in Lima, even simple combinations of these packages starts getting you above that 50%, and you see synergies between all these different interventions. Now, in San Francisco, there's a higher baseline coverage of services, and so it takes more to get to that 50% decline. In Lima, the baseline access was, was very limited. But even in San Francisco, um, what they saw was that with the combination of the five interventions put together, they're able to achieve a 50% decline in new infections, which is important given that we're talking, we're, we don't know the actual incidence, um, but we're talking about a very high prevalence population. So what are some of the clear data needs to advance transgender health and, and really prevention sciences? One of the things that I think comes out clearly is just dedicated studies with larger sample sizes. So Often what many of us are doing are using smaller subsets of other studies to try and do some analysis to better understand uh, the needs. And so larger sample sizes obviously would facilitate that. But clearly longitudinal data, cohort data, is going to be ex extremely important. And that's going to allow the opportunity for nested studies, but really to do meaningful interventions. And as we get going with interventions, there's also going to be a need to dedicate and, and to really understand what are going to be appropriate laboratory reference values, because currently the laboratory reference values are that of other men, uh, or that of men. And I think understanding and having dedicated laboratory reference values to make comparisons against uh, for trans populations is going to be really important. But the other piece, and, and then the last piece of this, is really better data about outcomes. So when we engage in this review, the vast, vast majority of studies are just epidemiologic studies, and we need more outcome-oriented studies. We know there's programs in place, and it's really an impetus for those programs to share their findings uh, above, uh, above with their other their traditional stakeholders. I think an encouraging finding here uh, is that when we embarked in this review, we saw that there's been a rapid increase in the amount of dedicated studies for trans populations over the last couple of years. And we hope that that trend is going to continue, because I think as it does, then we'll better understand both that epidemiology, but more about w how is it that we can better serve uh, these populations with combination services. So just some key themes. Um, you know, one, again, I've, I've said this, but there's a clear disconnect between the burden of HIV and the amount of ongoing uh, studies um, that we could find either through the NIH report or what's been published. There's also this data paradox that, uh, that applies, I think, especially to trans populations, whereas 
that there is the least amount of data available in the places with the most stigma. Uh, and I think it's encouraging to see an increase in amount of, of research and also an increasing amount of research